Hello, and welcome to Sobercast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting Sobercast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Oh, the pressure's on. <laughs> Hi, my name's Teresa. I'm an alcoholic. <laughs> And, oh, God, thank you, um, Julie and Matt, for asking me tonight. And, um, oh, God, I'm so nervous. I am not a – I have never been a main speaker. I get totally freaked out. I I do weird stuff. I'm disruptive in the back. I'm, like, looking for gum. Everyone's like, God, what are you doing? You know, it's like – Then I'm getting up, I feel something on my face, and my dress is, like, wrong, and, you know, that's how it is after 30 years of sobriety, you know? It's like, it just keeps getting better. So, um, um, my uh, sobriety birthday is 2-26-86, and um, I got sober when I was 22, and I'm 53 today. Um, I... um, I got so, uh, I was uh, raised in California. I'm just going to have to, you know, qualify because I always think when I hear people talk, I kind of want to hear a little qualification. Like, I hate when people skip over their drunk log because when I first got here, I needed to hear that you were kind of like me, you know, or I, I wasn't, I didn't really identify unless you did that. So, I'm going to have, I have a little bit more time tonight. I always run out of time. I sometimes don't get sober. I, um, I do all kinds of stuff. So bear with it. I'm going to try to keep on track. Um, I got, I feel like I got all this time. Like I'm kind of like excited, but cause I'm thinking maybe tonight I will actually get sober, you know? And, um, so I grew up in, um, in Southern California, my parents moved from Chicago. When I was two months old, we moved to Santa Monica. And then we moved to Culver City. And then um, most of my life I spent in Redondo Beach. And I went to high, I went to elementary, junior, and high school there. And, um, you know, I was one of those kids that I always had that, um, you know, that hole inside that, I was just like really super lonely, always super bored. You know, I was always looking for stuff and I was kind of, um, I don't know if I was ever quiet, quiet, but I was very, um, I was likable. I was a good kid, but I was always like looking for something and I always felt different and kind of weirdy, you know? And, um, when we moved to Redondo Beach, when I was in sixth grade, my parents always were workers. So our house, we had a couple of friends, like, where their parents were, were always gone. And ours was one of them. And uh, we used to have a wine cellar in the bottom of our house and with no wine. But it was like one of those old, like, um, houses, like, in the 1920s. And um, that's where we began in that house, you know. We were all kind of bored, you know, and we we're in sixth grade, and we would always go to my house, and we would be sitting around, and this is how it started. You know, we'd, we'd get, like, a couple cigarettes from someone's mom, and then we'd steal a couple beers from each other's parents' house, and then we all bring it to the my house, to the wine house. And... um you know, we would sit in there and we would kind of get drunk and we would start doing stupid stuff. And, you know, and, you know, I really liked that feeling I got the first time I drank, you know, because, you know, I felt funny. I felt like not so boring. I felt so alive, you know, and I remember that. And, um, you know, as I got older, I, um, you know, when I got into high, when I got into junior high, it really started to take off. And, um, we, we lived by the beach. We lived probably like two blocks from the beach and we, that was our hangout. So we, we all had bikes and we would all go down to the beach and there we had this, um, we had a, we had, we went to Sapphire and Topaz beach. That's what it was called. It had a jetty out in the middle and we were underage. So we would always have to go on the jetty to drink or we'd get in trouble from the cops. 
So, you know, we always had older friends and we always managed to get alcohol and we used to go out to, um, you know, to the beach every day. That's what we did. We went to the beach and we drank and, you know, that just progressively got worse and worse. I mean, I was going in the winter time. I mean, granted, California is still pretty warm, but I mean, we're drinking all the time down there and, you know, the summertime was the best and, um, you know, what happened to me is, you know, I started drinking and I started doing things that were were really wild. I was like this really good kid and then all of a sudden I started drinking and the next thing you know, I am I'm going to like go steal a bunch of clothes or and I never was a stealer, you know, and my sister and my cousin and that's who I drank with is my sister and my cousin when we had this other friend. And we would um we would uh, go to the beach, and then we'd find out where the party was, and then their idea was we should get new clothes, you know? So we should um, hit, you know, we never had any money. So we hit Broadway, Broadway and I think Robinson or something, and I was like the worst stealer. I mean, I did not know how to do bad stuff. I was like, they were like good, though. They would go in there and get those machines to take off the tags and get the stuff and get the tag off. They had the tag machine. And I was just like, Oh my God, is anyone looking? I'm like, Oh, I got a shirt, you know? And I was just like, so bad at stealing, you know? And I did it a couple times and I got away with it. And I remember one time we went and we were so drunk and that's the only way I could steal was when I was drunk. Cause I was not a stealer. And I must've had about six or I was getting kind of daredevil-y, you know, for, who I was, you know, I was like kind of pushing it. And I had about six or seven items at time. Usually I just took one. I was like, just grateful to get a scarf, you know, or something. And, um, <laughs> this time I, I had a few things and, um, my friend Amy and I were there and she, she, we partnered up, like we were like this little crew of stealers. And I, I was going out and I got halfway out and I hear this, Hey, you. And I was just like, Ooh, someone's calling us. That's not good. And I look behind and there, there's the police, the, the Broadway police, the security. And I was like, Oh my God, we're getting caught. And they're like, stop. And I'm like, Oh my God, Amy, come on. We got to go. We got to go. And we start running. We got caught. <laughs> and, um, you know, I had like a, I had a lot of stuff. I mean, I didn't have that much stuff, but it was worth a lot of money, the stuff that I took. And, you know, I just turned 18. So, you know, the rule with that is, you know, you get prosecuted. And my friend Amy was 17. So um, we got taken to jail, and that was my first time in jail. And um, so I'm in jail, and, you know, I got out, and I, um, I had, like, I got... I got in a lot of trouble for that. I ha I think I had over like $600 worth of stuff. I got prosecuted. Um, I had to go to court. Like it was like bad. I was like, Oh my God, you know, I've like get caught the first time and look at all this stuff. Oh my God. So I had to go to court and, um, I got the judge gave me, um, 500 hours of community service. And I thought, oh, my God, like, that's like a lot. Like, how am I going to work, do that, party, go to the beach, blah, blah, blah. And my mind was just like, that, how, do, who gets that? Like, I was just, just couldn't get over it, I, you know. And um, so my first job when, with my 500 community hour job was to go to the, um, I had a preschool job. I just had to show up, do a little five-hour thing with the kids. And, you know, that's it. And that was going pretty good. And then I started drinking and more. And then it started getting harder. And then I had to show up to court with to be done with my 500 hours. And, of course, I have like 70. And um, so I go back and he's like, did you finish? And I'm like, you know, I did not finish. I am so I can I have an extension? And he's just like, well, okay, but you know, you get, this is how many months you get and you need to be done. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> so I, um, you know, I did that job again. And again, I'm drinking, I'm partying. I don't have time to do these community service hours, you know? And so I go back to court again. I was like, 
I'm going to get in trouble this time. I know it. So I go back and I'm sitting there trying to figure out like what's going to happen. And, and I, and I get the same judge like four times. I was like, Oh my God, you know? And so he's like, Teresa, (laughs) come on. You know, you get, this is your third time. This, you don't get that, that job anymore. You're going to pick up papers on the beach. And I'm like, Oh no, I, I can't do that. That's too early. Um, no. And he's like, well, that's what you get when you can't finish your hours. And I'm like, oh my God. Okay. So I didn't want to go to jail. So I get this job to pick, you have to wear these orange outfits. I mean, in front of all my friends, cause I knew everybody at the beach and I think I did it like twice. And I was like, I am not doing this. Like I am beyond this. This, I can't, I'm embarrassed. I was like, no way I'm getting out of this. So I was sitting on the bus going to court again, and I'm sitting there with my card, and I'm like, I'm just going to erase some of this and put a few more on, and then I'm going to go back. And I was sitting in there, and I knew I got up there, and the I go, God, I just I was making up this story in my head when I was going to go up there, right? I got it all down. I'm going to do it. I get up there, and the courtroom is quiet. There's like all these people like today, and I was like, you know? He goes, Teresa, uh, again, Judge Willett, he's like, did you finish? I'm like, you know what? Funny story. I was doing it, and somebody tried to, like, kidnap me in their van, and the courtroom's just like, oh, my God, really? Or they couldn't believe it. And I was like, you know, I can't do this. such a dangerous job. I cannot do that. And he's like, you know what? Well, that might be so, but you're going to jail. And I was like, well, okay, well, when do I, can I go home? I get to go home, right? And he's like, no, you don't get to go home. I go, I don't get to grab anything. He's like, no, you're going to jail right now. So, you know, right in court, it was done, you know, three months in jail for that. And, um, you know, I got taken away there, got sent to Sybil Brown, and that was my first stint in, in jail. And I'll tell you about jail. I kind of like jail, and this is why. Because when you're in jail, you get free stuff. You get to sleep. You get to have some friends, you know. You get to talk to people that have your same issues. And you know what? It's not that bad, you know. And um, I didn't really mind it. I did kind of get there. And, um, you know, when I got out, I got three months, and I got out for good behavior. And no one could believe I was in jail for this because, you know, like, they're just, they're, like, stealing. And this time, I'm like, yep. So, you know, I, what, I got out, my friend came and picked me up from jail, and, um, you know, right away I'm, like, off and running. And, um, you know, my drinking had progressed. Like, it went from, it went from like, here to there. And th- there was, like, some line that I felt, like, it was different. Like, there was some line that I had crossed that it was just, it went from normal drinking to alcoholic drinking. And, um, you know, I was a daily drinker. I was, you know, I started doing other stuff and I love, but I love drinking. Drinking was my number one thing. Um, I mostly drank, you know, once in a while I'd try, I, I tried some other stuff, but I, tr- I did that so I could drink longer. And, you know, I wasn't a very picky drinker. I mean, my first drink was Ripple and I don't know if you guys have ever had that stuff. It has no real grapes in it. Um, it's like fuzzy and it's like two bucks a bottle, you know, and, um, I love that stuff and you, you could get really drunk on that. And, um, I liked beer. I liked wine and, um, I liked wine coolers. I liked everything bubbly. It felt like, you know, it was, if it had bubbles in it, I was on it. And, um, you know, and my drinking just got worse and worse. And, you know, I was, uh, you know, I was just drinking, I was drinking a lot and I was getting in trouble and my drinking was progressing. And, um, you know, I was living, um, I moved out when I was 18, I graduated high school and I was drinking a lot. And, um, I, uh, you know, I started getting into trouble and I, uh, I was riding my bike home one day and I was at a party. And this is the other thing with drinking, like your mind starts thinking like this. Well, if I don't eat, I could drink more. And if I, you you start thinking of all these things that where you can 
you think you're going to get drunker, but you really get sick. And then you have to get sick and then you have to drink again. You know, it's like, it was like this weird thing that my mind was doing. And um, I went to this barbecue and I didn't eat any of the barbecue food there. All I drank was this rum punch. And I thought if I didn't eat, I would get drunker, which I did. But then I didn't want to eat. And, um, you know, I was going home and I borrowed my friend's bike. And um, I was super, super drunk. And she goes, are you sure you're okay to ride the bike? I'm like, yeah, I'm going to, I'll be fine. And, um, you know, I was riding my bike and I got halfway down the hill and I was stopped by the Daily Breeze. There was this big newspaper thing and there was a big bulletin. It had a McDonald's like shake and a burger and some fries. And I was just like, oh my God, I was so hungry. I just was sitting there at the light going, oh, I'm going to McDonald's right now. Ugh. And, um, I rolled down this hill on the bike. Like, I just kept rolling and rolling and rolling. I must have hit two cars. I woke up, and there was these flares everywhere. Like, traffic was blocked. I was like, oh, my God. Like, you know your first thought when you're drinking? Like, this cannot be good. And um, I woke up, and um, I was looking around, and I thought, you know, I am. Um, I'm like in big trouble right now. This is, oh, I can't even move, you know, and I had broke my jaw. I had these rocks just stuck into every part of my skin from the road because I had shorts on and I was coming home from the barbecue, like a beachy barbecue. And, um, I had a hole in my chin and I could not move. And, um, all I could think about was my mom is going to be so mad about this one. I mean, that's my thought. That's my thinking, you know, it's like, not, you know, is anyone else hurt or anything? I'm going to be in trouble. And, um, you know, I had to go to an ambulance to the hospital and, um, you know, I had a broken jaw. I had, I had like 25 stitches. I had just, they had to take out all the, the pebbles that got stuck in my legs. And, and my mom was pissed. She was just like, Oh my God, you are just, what's happening to you? And I'm just like, you know what? I don't, I just went to a barbecue and she was like, well, your drinking is progressing into something really not so good. And, um, you know, I had to have my jaw wired for six weeks and she bought me a wire cutters cause she was so afraid that I was going to get sick and kill, you know, choke on my vomit. And, um, so, you know, for, um, for six weeks, I had that, and I still drank. I found a way to drink with a straw. You just put put it through, and you can. Ju you have to be careful, though. I mean, I had it down to a T when I had the job when I had my jaw broken, and um, I got my jaw, you know, unwired, and I was just like going doing the same thing over and over, not going anywhere, just drinking and drinking a lot. And um, I, uh, you know, my parents were getting really concerned, and. Um, I got kicked out of my friend's house and I had to move back home. And, and my mom and dad were like, you know, we're really concerned about you. you. Your drinking is way out of control. And, and you know what, when I'm in trouble, I'm, I, I tend to agree with people because I want to get out of trouble. And I'm like, you know what, you're right. I am really a drinking too much and I need help. And they're just like, we, yeah, we're going to get you help. And, um, we think you should go to AA meetings and, you know, and you can live here, but you have to do certain things. And I'm like, yeah, I could do that. You know, I was just like looking for a way out, you know, just looking for a way to get out of trouble, you know? And so I moved back in and, um, my dad was dropping me off at meetings and I was going into the meetings and I would sit in the back and I wouldn't really get involved in the meeting. And then I would be out of there. And, um, I did that for about five months. And, um, you know, one time, you know, I never got active in those meetings. I'd just come and kind of sit in the back and just kind of be on the outskirts. And one day, um, I decided, I did, I just decided I, my dad was, my mom were all, Oh, you're doing so good. You haven't drank for so long. And I'm like, I know. Right. I, and they're just like, you're doing, Oh, we're just so proud of you. And I'm like, and I was crazy. Like I couldn't stand the way I felt like I was just like, I had this feeling like I could not stand, you know, I, 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 I it was like, I it was unbearable. And, um, I got this thought at the meeting one night, I was going to go and I was going to say, I was going to the show after this. And I was going to tell my dad, I was going to the movies and that, um, you know, I was going to call my friend and he, he's going to pick me up. And, um, 
we weren't going to the movies. And um, I decided it was drinking time. I had enough of this. And um, he came and picked me up. And we went to, like, every bar there was in Redondo Beach. The Poop Shoot, the Red Onion, the Blue Moon Saloon, and the... We just went to everything, and I was in the Red Onion. That was the last place I was, and I was getting drunk. Oh, my God. And I was just like, you know, I was having the time of my life. I was feeling so good. That feeling of horribleness was gone, and um, I, uh, it was last call, and I was drunk. I could barely walk, and my friend was like, we, we got to go, and I'm like, okay. And um, we were walking out, and um, I'm like, well, let's just walk home. He's like, no, let's drive home. I'm like, we can't drive home. We're drunk. We're too drunk. No, we're not driving. He's like, well, why don't you just drive? And I'm like, I don't think I can drive, but, I mean, if you want to make a deal, maybe. I don't know. And he's like, well, I can't drive. You drive. And I'm like, well, this is the deal. If something happens, I need you to raise your hand and say I'm not responsible for anything that Teresa does tonight. And he's like, okay, I'm, you're not, I'm not responsible. And I'm like, just promise me you're not going to come after me if something happens because I'm feeling this is not a good idea. <laughs> and um, we got in his truck, and um, I pulled out of um, the Red Onion, and I, his door flew open. And I don't know why, but I thought I should tr- close that. I'm driving, and I'm closing his door. I let go of the steering wheel and hit this car and just – it rammed right into the side of it and I was like oh my god you know and he's like Jesus and I'm like I told you I was not ready for this and I I'm like oh my god we gotta go and he's like and I look across the street and I see this cop on the motorcycle and I'm just like we're both like look at each other and I'm like we gotta take off like I just told my friend I'm getting out of here and he's like there is a cop across the street and I think he noticed you (laughs) and I'm like you know what I am taking off and um I just drove around and I was driving around Redondo Beach and I was like oh my god I had seven cop cars in the back of me and my friend's like I think you need to pull over and I'm like no no we can get away I, I know it and he's like there's no getting away Teresa you're done and I just was like oh god I was just I didn't want to be in trouble I did not want to go to jail and it was happening, and um, I pulled over, and you know, they, they ask you, have you been drinking? And I was like, no, I'm just going to say that. You know those commercials, you see all that beer come out? That's what I felt like, you know? It was just like, he, they make you do that test, and I just totally failed that. It was two seconds, and I was in jail. And um, I was just sitting in there, and I was just like so drunk and just, thinking, I am in big trouble. My dad is going to be so pissed. And, you know, it's that, that feeling of, it was just the worst feeling. And, um, I was sitting in jail and then I thought about my phone call and I started getting weird in jail. I was like, can I have my phone call? Nope. And I was like, I want my phone call. Like, what can I have my phone? Like I started getting that, um, alcoholic, like pissy stuff going, you know, and I want my, I want my phone call. And he's like, you can't have your phone call. And they gave me one of those tin cups. And I was like, I want my phone call. I want my phone call. And um, then they're like, they wouldn't let me have that phone call. I was like, God dang it. So then they like put me in the quiet room with the glass, you know. And um, I was just sitting in there with this guy. And he's just like, Jesus, you know, like just sit there, you know. And and I was like, why can't they give me my phone call? Like I was just ramped up and alcoholed out and. You know, the morning came, and they gave me my phone call, and um, that, and I was sober by then, and I was really feeling gross and just horrible, and that incomprehensive demoralization was hitting really bad, and I called my dad, and you know that look when your someone comes, and they have that look in their eyes, like, again, one more time, they just, they're just looking at you, like, why can't you just not drink? Why can't you just be a normal person? And I just he was pissed too. And you know, when my dad was pissed, I just, and I want to get out of trouble. Like I hate being in trouble. And I'd be like, are you mad? And he's like, yeah, I'm mad. Yeah, I'm mad. And I was like, why are you mad? Like, you know, it's like, I was too much. 
And he's like, you are going to treatment. You are in so much trouble now. Now you have a hit and run. You're still on probation. And we're going to talk to a counselor right now. And I'm like, oh. So he got this counselor, and I had to go talk to this alcoholic counselor. And um, then I had to go to court a couple days later, and I was sentenced to, well, they said I could have three months deferred treatment if I went to treatment, and I could go do the treatment, and I'd come back, and we'd talk about what the um, the uh, punishment was. So I um, I was going to treatment, and I was getting really worried because you know that moment where you know you're an alcoholic, but you don't want to quit, and you're really getting worried about it, and that was where I was at. And um, um, all my friends were coming over, too. Like, it was like a funeral or something. Like, Teresa's getting sober. We better go see her. And um, <laughs> um, I was like a goodbye or something. It was really sad. And... Um, so I decide my I got to pick I wanted to go to the Betty Ford Center because my mind is thinking again. Betty Ford is only two hours from LA and my friends could still come out there and you know your mom my mind was still not in the I don't want to stop drinking, but I am gonna have to stop drinking because I'm in trouble. So the Betty Ford Clinic was out because my dad was somehow smarter than I was, and um, he knew that what was going to happen. He just, like, figured it out. He's like, I don't think that Betty Ford's good for you. It's too close to here. And I'm like, well, where do you have in mind? And he's like, there's this place in Tucson. And um, I'm thinking, Tucson, like the desert? I'm like, that's, like, so far. And he's like, yep, we're going tomorrow, and you are going to get in the car, and I'm driving you. And I was just like, oh, my God, I just the thought of it. And I was like, desert, oh, God, no. And um, so we're driving, and I just had that feeling like this is the end. I mean, I better get a six-pack on this trip, you know. Like, my mind was, like, just going, and I was just getting scared and worried, and I'm going to treatment in Tucson now. And and um, he's driving me, and I, th I did ask him for a six-pack. He said, nope. He was like, uh-uh. And I was like, come on, you know what? This is the end of my drinking. And he's like, I don't care. You do not need to, a six, I'm not buying you a six pack. And I was like, so I was sitting in the car and I was just doing weird. I was weird. I was out there and I was starting to sweat and I could feel the detox coming. I was like shaking. I was like, I was anxiety out. I was just, this trip was taking forever. And, um, we get there and he drops me off like suitcase. Bye-bye. And I was like, uh, wait, uh, um, I'll talk to you in a few weeks. And I'm like, God, you know, okay. And I was just, this sweating and just ter terrified. And I'm walking in this treatment center and I get in there and this guy's having convulsions right away. And I'm just like, Oh my God, you know, and I'm just, I'm just terrified and I don't want to be there and I'm crying now. And I get in there and, you know, they do their thing. And, and I was in treatment for about 28 days. And this place actually ended up being kind of nice. Um, they had a pool. I was like, a pool? My God, I might like it here. You know, I was like, I could lay out. And, and um, you know, it was like a dude ranch or something. I was like, ooh, you know, and I, I got in there and I was just out of it. I could think, right, I was just like, you know, the pool, oh, you know, the pool became like, ugh. And um, they made you, you know, work these steps, and they were making me do a lot of stuff. And there was a lot of young people in there. And um, I remember I had this little group of young kids I used to hang out with in there. And none of them were, like, in serious trouble like I was. And um, they were... Uh, they were smoking pot in treatment, and I thought there was cameras in treatment. I was not going to get caught for smoking pot in treatment, and um, they were doing all kinds of stuff, and I just was like, you know what? I'm going to jail if I get caught for anything right now. I have to be You know, my mind was always thinking of, you know, that other way out, and, um, you know, and I don't know what their deal was, but I wasn't going to do that. I was scared, and... Um, the counselors called me in the office and they said, you know, you have a um, three-month extension because I was almost going to go home. I was so excited I was going to get to go home. And, you know, they said, we, you know, we talked to the judge. They're going to let you have a little bit more time, but we all think that you should go to a halfway house. And I'm like, 
oh, okay. And I kind of noticed like some of these kids were going and I was like, God, I'm going to be the one not to have to go. You know, I always think I'm the special one. And, you know, then it was my turn and I, and I was just like, well, where's the halfway house? This is by LA, right? There's something by there, right? And they're like, yeah, this, well, no, but there's this, I go, well, where is it? And they go, well, the name's Santa, um, Santa Monica. And I'm like, Santa Monica, well, that's not very far from me. And they go, no, that's what the halfway house is called, it's in Nebraska. <laughs> and I was like, I'm like, no, I don't want to go there. Uh-uh, I'm not going there. And I want to go home. And um, they like, that's where you're going. I mean, that's what they have. And I'm like, oh, my God, Nebraska? Like, oh, I was, I was mad now. I was thinking of all kinds of stuff. I was like. You know, I was pit. Now I'm pissed. You know, and um, but I got to do it because I'm going to jail if I don't, right? And um, so I'm dri- They're driving me to the airport in this van, and I was just like thinking, I'm gonna go to the airport, and I'm changing this damn ticket. And right when I get there, and I'm in the airport looking, and I can't change the ticket. I was like, oh my god, I'm just. I was getting sweaty again. I was getting panicked. I was. 28 days sober, and I was really scared now. I was going way out of my comfort zone. And um, I got on the plane. I just, I got on the plane, and um, I was sitting by this guy that was drinking because it's back in the days where you could smoke and drink in the back of the plane. And this guy was already drunk, and he was drinking, spilling his drink on me. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to a halfway house today. You need to stop. I go, I don't, cannot smell like alcohol when I get there. And he's like, oh, have a drink, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, oh, my God. I, we started fighting in the in the plane. And um, I got kicked out of my seat, and I had to move. And, um, you know, now, I'm, now I got in a fight. I'm kicked out of my seat, and now I'm at, going to Nebraska. I mean, it was the worst day of my life. And um, I'm sitting there, and I'm just agony. I'm crying. I just am like, how? how am I going to get out of this? Like, this is happening. I, you know, and, and I opened the big book and it just fell on that page, Dr. Alcoholic Addict. It was the acceptance story. And I just started reading that, you know, because really it was about acceptance about what I was doing at that point. And, um, yeah, I read that and I got this feeling of cal- a little bit of calmness. And, um, you know, I got to that airport and these women picked me up and it was this big, huge, um, halfway house in Nebraska. It was like this Victorian house and it was women from all over the United States. And, um, I was kind of scared. I thought it was going to be like really bad. Like they're going to, I don't know, kill you. I don't know what I thought. (laughs) Kill you, rape you, whatever, you know, I just didn't know, you know, and, um, everybody was really nice and everybody was sober and everyone was my age and everyone was from a different state. And, you know, I just started doing the stuff there. And the counselor says, you know, you need to get a home, you need to go to meetings every day. You need to get a home group and you need to get a sponsor and you need to get a job. And I'm like a job. I cannot even stay. So I can't have a job. I need to like fix myself and I need to, you know, therapy out here and blah, blah, blah. And she's like, Nope, you got to pay your rent here. And I was like, Okay, you know, and um, I got a job. I started going to meetings, and um, my first meeting was. Oh my God! Look, that's already. See, I'm running out of time, right? <laughs> um, I got a job, and I started going to meetings, and um, I, uh, you know, I did really good. I went to a meeting every day, and I was in that halfway house for six months, and I got out, got an apartment there. And I started doing this, and I was at this young people's meeting, and they I found a sponsor there. My sponsor said, you need to get a commitment, and I got this commitment. And, um, you know, I started making a lot of friends. And um, I made this one friend there, and she came up to me, and she had kind of a – she looked like a skinhead. And I was she came up, and I was like, ooh, what does she want? And she's like – I'm like, ooh, she's coming up. And she goes, you want to go out to coffee? And I'm like, my head's like, nope, I don't want to go to coffee with you. <laughs> and then sh- I'm, and my lips were like, sure. And then um, it was really weird. And I went out to coffee and I, you know, we became best friends. And, um, you know, we had, we're both from Redondo Beach, we found out. We both lived two blocks from each other. And um, it's just, 
I still, she's still my best friend today. And, um, she moved back to LA and then soon after I followed her. And then, um, there I got into a, um, I got into another group, the Pacific group. And she's like, Oh, you should come to this group. And I'm like, what group's that? And she goes, Oh, you're going to love it. And I'm like, okay. And, um, I started going to this group and there was like 1200 people there. And I was like, I do not like this group, Pam. I'm not coming. And, um, she's like, you just keep coming. You're going to like it. And, you know, I got really active in that group and, um, you know, I, uh, got really active in Pacific group and we moved to Salt Lake city 10 years after that. And I married Greg and we were in Salt Lake city. And then, um, after Salt Lake city, we came here and, you know, I only got five minutes, huh? Oh my God. I knew this was going to happen. I'm sorry, you guys. Um, I, uh, I got, um, you know, when we were in Salt Lake city, I, you know, I had a baby, I had a, um, young, a young little infant and, um, I start, it was hard, you know, and, um, I start, I had, was going to two meetings and bringing my son and I, I, I wasn't doing very good there. And, um, I finally talked Greg after eight years of that there into moving here or back to LA and we moved here and I decided to get really active in, um, here. And, uh, I started going to Agape every day and I got, made a ton of friends there. And, um, I just got really active in Seattle, um, in Seattle and, uh, my sobriety took off again and I started to feel good. And, you know, um, yeah, there's so much stuff I can't talk about because I take up too much time talking about my drunk log. But, um, I, uh, you know, I, I came here and I love Seattle. I love the sobriety here and I knew things were going to be different here. And, um, Greg and I started, well, we started this meeting with 15 people. And as he said, it was, it was Greg after a while, it was Greg, me, Laura Lee, his mother, and this guy named Jim, and we were struggling, you know, we were just, it was hard, but we kept on going and it's the meeting it is today, you know, and you know, if, if you knew, I have worked the steps and I have done a lot of work here and I have, I sponsor people. I, I do, I've always been in the middle of the boat and this is the best, this is the best advice I can give to you. S keep going to meetings until you like, until you like it here, because I did not like it here when I first came here. I was obsessed with alcohol when I got to these rooms. I would sit in my seat and I would shake and think of ways I could drink. And I kept coming back and I kept doing what they told me to do. I got in the middle of the boat. And that is my best ex advice. Stay here until you like it here. And do what they tell you to do. Don't fight it because it's just, just do it. You know, that's the second step. Just, just take that action and do the stuff they tell you to do. Because, you know, that's what happened for me. And, um, you know, I'm grateful. I have. I just turned 30 last month and, you know, I've had the same sponsor for 27 years. Um, you know, I've worked the steps and I've done the work here and I've stayed in the boat and, um, I am so grateful and this is the best thing that's ever happened to me. So thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.